Hello, and thank you for joining me once again on the Finish More Music podcast. So we've got an epic, epic episode for you. Another interview with a kick-ass producer. We are joined by a rising star of the house music scene. And I say that, but I'm not quite comfortable with it because I think he has more than landed already. He's got an incredible stream of releases on top labels from Get Physical to Kindish Voltaire, Magician on Duty, the list goes on and on. Now, if you are not familiar with our guest, Addison, Matt, uh, Addison, I'm going to spell it for you as well because I want you to go and check out his music right now. It's A-D-I-S-Y-N. As soon as you finish this episode, you want to jump on it because they are beautifully crafted pieces of music. Sonically, he's on point and musically as well. The composition, the arrangement, the melodies, the groove is locked in. Everything punches out at you. If you've not heard his music, you do not want to miss it. And you definitely don't want to hear what he's got to say about music as well, because he's somebody who really thinks deeply about his music, the structure, the workflow, what he wants to say with it. And that comes across just in so many ways when you're listening to him all lit up and riffing on about his art. So let's get cracking right now. Matt, how the devil are you? Hey, Keith, I'm, I'm doing super good. Thanks for having me. Mate. So, so good. Um, I know that I've just bigged you up there in the way that you talk about music. So I don't mean to have chucked you under the bus, but it's always fascinating when we talk about it because you're someone who thinks deeply about what you're doing. Um, it means so much to you and that comes across in abundance when we're talking about music before we get into it and i know we're going to discuss everything from your ethos and what you look for in a good piece of music uh, that you're making and your workflow and all of these things i'd love to just jump back and look at what got you into this music what got you so passionate and so immersed hmm. in the world of dance music and production and djing which you do all of these things um, you know, I guess music's always been in my life since I was young. I was always like a super avid listener and I was always very into it. Um, but I didn't start playing and producing until I was like 15, 16. And, uh, I guess what really sparked it is, uh, you know, when I started going to parties and raves and, and all that stuff and, uh, and I guess, uh, you know, I didn't always do house music either. I was very into like uh, more experimental music, like uh, IDM or Aphex Twin was like a huge influence. I just loved how alien and bizarre it sounded. And I was super into that, um, you know, glitch music, acid house, all that weird stuff. Um, but, uh, you know, I think I slowly evolved into more danceable music when, uh, yeah, I think when I was like 16 and I started going to parties and it's funny because I used to hate house music because, you know, it, used, it was very straight, very simple, very like ordinary kind of music to me at first. But then I started going to parties a lot and this was always like the theme song at these parties. It was always like, you know, these steady beats, these grooves. And, and after a while of going to these things, I realized like this is really good music for the environment. It's very good music for these parties um and I, and it started to grow on me you know and uh and not only that but i started to realize there's different types of house music it's not all generic tech house you know there's there's deeper shades there's more experimental shades you know you can combine some of these weird trippy elements into into house music and, and it could work you know and it's like a whole you know beautiful thing so uh so yeah, so I kind of got sucked into it, I guess, when I was like 16-ish and, uh, you know, started, started it, it, it was kind of the lifestyle that, that drew me into it, you know? I started going to these parties so much that I realized, wow, I must kind of like this music, you know? And then I guess the next step was, you know, how, how do I make it? So. Yeah, totally. So then tell us about that. <laughs> what, was, what were your first tentative uh, steps into the world of dance music into the world of producing dance music even okay so um okay so a little background um you know i met some some kids when i was in high school who were making like hip-hop music and stuff like that and uh and 
and it seemed really interesting to me and cool. And I remember my dad got me like a MPC 5000 when I was like young, cause he, he saw like, I really wanted to get into this stuff. And, uh, and I locked myself up in my room with that MPC 5000 for like a year. And I just made a bunch of like hip hop beats and, you know, I, I did do all the sequencing on the MPC 5000, write little songs on it and, and all of that. And uh, after a year of that, um, I realized I needed to get Ableton. I needed more possibilities. Um, you know, it just, I just had this, you know, I just knew like it was the evolution and, you know, it's like what all the pros were using. Um, so I got Ableton and uh, started making weird stuff on that. Uh, but I wasn't doing dance music at the time. You know, it wasn't until I had this kind of Eureka moment. Um, you know, I think what's got me into dance music was, uh, was when I started hearing like more interesting types of house music, you know, cause like I said, I didn't really like it that much at first, but uh, you know, I think uh, music like dub techno really changed uh, my faith in that, you know, when I heard these deeper atmospheric, more textural sounds. Um, I remember being in my room one day and I was up late working and, and I think I stumbled across like, deep chord or some some like you know dub techno guy or whatever on youtube and and i was just there listening to it and i was listening to it like really late into the night like you know like four in the morning and just song after song and then i just got kind of captured by the music and and sucked into it and and i had this moment where i was like wow this is beautiful and i was like i think i think i finally understand it you know like i think i finally get what's happening and what it's trying to tell me and and i think that's when I caught the book. It was like that, you know, I was making a bunch of weird, you know, trying to make like glitchy, weird. I mean, I had no purpose before this, you know, I was making very strange abstract music. I wish I could pull up some of the files so you can hear it. I mean, my mind is a weird place. But then when I had this moment, you know, after going to these clubs, and, you know, after I think listening to this, uh, hearing deep chord and hearing dub techno, I was like, this is really like peaceful. Um, and so that's kind of when I got the bug for techno and house and all that stuff. Um, so did you start, because obviously your your music now is on the, well, I don't know, how would you describe it? I don't, with all of the genres, now, <laughs> I daren't step into anything other than house music. Um, yeah. But, but what would you, what would you call it? Just house or there's a specific type or a characteristic you would attach to it? I mean, when I think of house, I think of just like drum loops and like something kind of straight forward like uh i have a hard time saying what i make i think it's on the cusp of progressive uh on the cusp of deep house um you know i think there's some like trippy like psychedelic influence also um you know it's it's really hard to say i say deep house to most people to keep it simple so I don't yeah. have to go into like a long-winded explanation. Yeah, which I've just gone. <laughs> <laughs> just gone what you do, and I love it. I love yeah. it. Yeah. So the only reason that I, I wanted to, to to get there was just to say, obviously, you're saying that you were listening to sort of the the trippy, deep uh, kind of side of techno. Is that yeah. how you started? And if so, yeah. Uh, what what was the evolution that's got you to where you are now? So. <laughs> So I guess, yeah, like, I guess, I guess a few years into producing, you know, I had that moment with like dub techno and I was like, this is what I want to make. And I started making dub techno a lot. You know, I started researching it. I started making it. Um, uh, that's, that's my roots, I think, in house music is, is, is the dub sound, you know, and I think my first release departure, you can hear that a lot. You know, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of dub elements in it, you know, uh, chords atmosphere you know echoes you know just manipulations of chord hits you know throughout the song you know that kind of hypnotic sound but i also i guess incorporate other elements because i think uh i guess i'm just trying to do something that excites me you know i also put in like melodies i also chop up samples and you know uh, give it a bit more structure because i think a lot of dub stuff is just monotonous for like 10 15 minutes plus so um, I guess I try to, you know, keep it exciting, you know, but, but my roots are definitely in, in the dub stuff and I still really love it, but I'm also trying to expand and, you know, uh, get influenced by other styles of music. 
Yeah, I mean, I, you know as well, I love Departure. I absolutely love that track. You know, I still listen to that. I think it's an absolutely great piece of music. I don't know whether you listen back to it now and go, ooh, I don't know. I'd much prefer what I'm doing now. But for me, it really, really worked. You know, it's funny because it still works for me too. You know, a friend sent me a video of some guys like playing it on a live stream yesterday. And I was like, it's crazy that it's like two years old now or something. And it's still like, I'm still cool with it. I don't hate it. It's a great piece of music. It really is. It works well. I mean, obviously you, that was one of the, the tracks that you sort of pulled apart and showed everyone how you build it when you did the, yeah. the masterclass inside of FMM and everyone was dialed into it. And I mean, that's not that long ago. It's, you know, the, tr the track had, had uh, matured by then and everybody was still like, yeah, this is cool. How'd you make that? How did you do that? Oh my God, that's amazing. Yeah. So it's yeah, that's awesome. know, still totally rocking. So what I'm hearing here is quite, interesting because we've got the musical journey in terms of how it's evolved how you're thinking about the different things that you're trying to incorporate in it and that sounds to me like it's running parallel also to your actual journey of producing music that we've talked about in the past where you started out with perhaps something that was a more simplistic methodology and then that's moved all the way through to what you're doing now which is a lot more experimental so without me wanting to totally give the punchline away what's been the if we'd start sort of start getting into the details of the production side of things and stuff in the studio what were you doing when you first started producing and how did that aid you and then we'll start talking about how you're developing as an artist now because you've got a very different kind of approach um okay you know i guess when i first started making music um i didn't have a whole bunch of knowledge um you know i really just tried to do what what sounded good and that was always my ethos from the beginning you know i was very much into just doing what i liked and it's still what i do today slightly different you know but uh, ultimately, I was just very into just creating things that sounded nice to me. Um, but, you know, I didn't have a lot of tools at the time. You know, I'm self-taught. I never went to school. I never studied theory, you know. But I, I would be able to just play around the keys and find things that sounded good. Um, but, you know, the problem with this when I first started is, you know, I there's certain scales that I went to. And I got very comfortable with those scales, you know. Um, you know, and I would always kind of write in those scales and write similar melodies. And I guess also an issue I had when I first started is uh, I didn't know enough about theory to like understand music. You know, I think music's a language. When I listen to music now, I can tell when it's a minor melody or if it's a major chord or, you know, if they're introducing like a, like a jazz or a blues tone. Or I mean, now it's like a communicative language that, you know, I can understand, which is really nice. But at the time, I didn't have that. Uh, so I feel like when I first started off, it was it was kind of like being in the dark. Like I would just do stuff that sounded good and, you know, try a lot of things and pray I would land on something that works. And uh, and I think the first, you know, few years was, was kind of like, I don't know, nothing really that great. I mean, I, I was writing a lot of music every day uh, and I was, I was having fun, but looking back, I mean, uh, you know, I wish I had more, uh, more foundational knowledge. You know, I wish, I wish I started studying earlier with like professionals, you know, cause a few years into making music, I wasn't happy. You know, I was like, all this stuff just isn't sounding as good as the pros, you know? And I remember trying to make music cause I, there was a point where I was into like more R and B ish stuff. Like there was this group called Bonducks. I don't know if you know who they are, but these two little kids in London and they were making like really cool like future house or what's it called like garage or future-ish bass what I don't know it's a kind of R&B-ish with like really glitchy beats and I remember trying to make music like that and I just couldn't like I would try so hard you know to do these like chords and these vocals and these atmospheric breakdowns and these like cool like you know drops and stuff and and then there was a moment where I was like whoa I can't just sit here and try to remake this stuff like I actually need to take a step back and I need to learn about music more. I don't know enough about chord structures. I don't know about enough about theory because these kids were writing like really nice, like 11th chords, you know, jazz chords and stuff like this. And 
I didn't know enough about theory to even make stuff like that. And, and that's when I had this moment where I was like, shit, dude, I can't just sit here and just try to go full force on making music. Like I actually need to go back to like studying um, just some basic stuff. And this was a few years in the making, like I was making music for a few years now, making like weird electronic music. And I realized, whoa, there's huge chunks that I've just never picked up on. And I thought, oh, I'm, I'll figure it out along the way. You know, anyways, um, around that time, you know, I started, meeting with people and looking for mentors. I mean, you know, I, uh, there's this guy, Bill Gordon, uh, who a friend put me in touch with. And he's, he's this older guy, a uh, brilliant pianist. And I would go to his house once a week and we would just, and I told him at first, I don't want to learn theory. You know, I don't want to learn so uh, traditionally, like I don't want to learn how to read sheet music. You know, I just want to understand, I guess, I don't know, chord scales better. I don't know what some right? notes to press together that sound good, will you, Bill? <laughs> uh <laughs> Bill was a genius and I would go there once a week and uh he taught me the basics. The basic stuff that everyone needs to know if they're trying to make music. How many scales are there? Do you know Keith? No, oh, there's loads. Yeah. Okay. Loads well, loads. I don't know if there's a total number, but good look. Are you talking when we're covering everything from all the blues scales to really exotic scales? Or the main talking, scales. The you're main talking scales. Talking about the modes, are you? No, the main scales. Go on. You tell. You tell me. There's 24. Like really, there's 24 main scales. You know, right. you have 12 notes. Each note has a major. Each note has a minor. You should know that for sure, right? Right. Okay. You know, and, uh, yeah, there's modes, but the modes are taken from the scales. You know, you choose a different start point on each scale and you have a mode, right? And Right, so you're, what you're talking about when you're talking about a scale is you're happy to say, you know, C major, D major, E major, and so on. That is that is what you're referring to as opposed to saying a major scale, a minor scale, a Dorian scale, a Phrygian, and so yeah. on. That's, right, okay, I'm with you. I'm just saying each note has a major and minor scale. There's 12 notes in Western music. So there's, you know, there's 24 scales that most music's written in. And then, you know, the modes are kind of something a little different. And then you have your weirder scales. You know, you have Eastern music, which has more notes, has like notes in between notes, you know, so there's even weird, but most people are writing in one of those 24 scales. Um, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Okay. I didn't know about, you know, my basic chords, you know, uh, you know, you know, major, minor, augmented, suspended, diminished, whatever. I mean, look, a lot of the stuff, a lot of producers don't know, but I remember after studying with Bill for like a few months or a year, I was like, wow, like this is really powerful. Like I can, that's when I began to understand music. You know, I started listening to music I liked that used to just confuse me before and how good it was. I didn't know what was going on and I can understand it now. I understand why music sounds good and why music sounds interesting. And it's frustrating sometimes because I don't, because some guys use some pretty advanced stuff and, or, you know, they just put together some really convincing compositions. But, but I feel like, you know, learning theory was so huge for me in so many ways, you know, and I'm not saying I'm a great music theory person, but, but like I know enough now to, 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 to speak the language, at least, at least a little bit. Right. Okay. So, in terms of your so for example if you were making dub techno um you probably wouldn't really need to know this stuff because a lot of it isn't that advanced so you might just mm -hmm. play around and get a couple of chords but the music that you're making now where you're exploring with different chords harmonies and melodies that's proven to be a, a big advantage for you yeah, so let's talk about like uh, a cool composition, for example. Um, it's really interesting. Like, there's some songs, you know, that I like or songs I make where I'm I'm pretty particular about the harmonies and how the song builds, right? Like, like if it's a dub track, for example, you know, let's say most of the song will be in a in a minor scale, right? You know, there'll be like a sustained chord in a minor scale. There'll be chords, chord hits, or whatever. But everything's kind of hitting that that natural minor, you know, uh, the first, the fourth chord maybe, and, and that will be building, but, but there's a, there's a lead melody coming in and we haven't introduced it yet. You know, and that melody's going to come three minutes in after we've built the groove and built the suspense. Right. But the melody is written in a mode, right? The whole song, all the chords, all the atmosphere are natural minor. And then the melody comes in a mode, right? 
And then when you hear the melody harmonize with, with the chords and the sustain and the atmosphere, it, it's interesting, you know? And this is just a very basic, like, a compositional idea, right? Where, you know, if you know a little bit of theory, you can come up with these cool concepts. Right. Okay. So this is interesting. So what you're saying now, and we're, we're kind of, I guess, moving a little bit into your production process, but sorry, <laughs> no, 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 this is, this is great because we're, we're going, you know, it, it's, it's fascinating kind of following the river and seeing where um, we yeah, I'm just, I'm just letting it come out of my brain no, as, that's, it, that's, as it goes. That's, that's okay. exactly how I love this show to be. Uh, yeah. Okay. So where were we? Uh, right. So I was talking about the, fact that we love the i love the show to just go along like a, a river and it's our, right. our discovery of finding out the deeper stuff and getting more into the interesting things so right. what you're now saying uh is that when you are using your music theory and the speaking the language of it actually before you even sit down to write you might have been using that knowledge in order to come up with a concept of something you're now going to explore. Is that right? Did I understand that correctly? Yeah. I just try to use theory in my compositions. I try to, I try to incorporate that in my compositions. You know, I, I like the idea of shifting from major scales to modes or writing a song in a minor, in, a, in like a minor scale and, you know, you thinking it's minor and then in the middle introducing a melody that's actually in a mode or in, you know, in, in you know, some type of mode. And I just think harmonically it's more interesting. Right. Okay, cool. Yeah. So totally and, with and, you. and a lot of the music I like, you know, when I like listen to it and kind of study the melodies and all this stuff, you know, I, I realize a lot of it is playing with some cool, um, cool theory concepts i mean i think all good i mean i think to be a really good producer is like you know you got to be a theory nerd oh that's a claim that's a big one <laughs> well, I'm... I, I would say that there's a there's a lot of uh, electronic music out there that doesn't have very much what i would call in the way of the knowledge of medium music theory at all i mean there's a load of cracking progressive house tracks that might just be like one four five or even just one five one five one five chords with a cool riff over it and then a load of amazing noises and stuff and a badass groove for or a synth sequence or an arc or something like that that could light it up so i can i totally can see the advantages of it and it's a cool thing to know depending on how you're exploring the music but it feels like quite a big grand statement to say that you're it's really be, not you're it's really not theory. tell me it's not i mean we're making music should you not know about music i mean it's like you know i mean it's, it's like paradoxical it's like yeah you should know theory if you don't know theory you're shooting yourself in the foot i'm not saying you know be in an orchestra but like know it pretty good know it pretty good if you're gonna be at a computer every day like drilling in hours like yeah maybe dedicate a little time to theory here and there it's like ah but that's uh, that's uh, different to being a theory <laughs> nerd isn't it <laughs> i think yeah i guess i guess i guess i i i'm a fan of like you know understanding theory pretty good like being able to to draw in good melodies you know being able to like come up with some cool ideas um uh, you know, just just in terms of like song arrangement or layout or, or being able to, to switch modes in the middle of the song, like in a breakdown, you know, and and it's funny because I think a lot of the progressive house coming out today is super musical, man. Like like a lot of the stuff on Lost and Found, like Roy Rosenfeld, for example, like these guys know music pretty good. I'm not they're probably not playing in orchestras. They're not they're not. Maybe that's what you call theory nerd. Maybe my definition of theory nerd isn't as extreme, but. Oh no, I'd agree. I mean, it lost and found for sure, but I can yeah. I can think of looking totally at the other end of the spectrum and then looking at anything from sort of loopy techno yeah. to minimal techno and and genres like that, which some of them are just completely atonal. So they they're just based on noise. Well, I hate I hate the atonal music. I hate the the, the, uh, tech, the atonal there, there techno. Okay. So if we wanna if we wanna write music that that you like we definitely need to know some music theory. <laughs> now I get it. <laughs> that is so not true. I don't, like, writing atonal music just sounds like, I mean, I don't know. That's, that's not my direction at all. Not saying that music is that musical either, <laughs> but uh, that's not the stuff that I like. I mean, I like to play stuff at parties that's, that like, people are having fun too. People want to have fun. People want to dance. People want to have a good time, you know? I want the music to reflect that. So, you know, I'm not trying to play like dark music or, 
weird. Like I'm, I'm so over dark music, man. I'm so over that stuff. Like I don't, I'm so uninterested. Um, you know, I want music that's, that's fun and has energy to it. And it doesn't have to be that, that musical. I'm still very, you know, driven around, uh, you know, having good grooves, having like good bass lines. Um, but I, I like, I like to have, you know, some sort of musicality in it. Like that gives it a theme that gives it a, the song an identity. Yeah, totally. I mean, one of the things for me with having a, a degree of music theory knowledge is being able, if you, of course, are writing stuff with melodies and chords and so on in it, is that it's easy to get into a rut when you're doing that stuff if you don't have any knowledge of the language at all. It's easy to get to a point in the track where you're like, ah, something needs to happen or something doesn't sound right or something feels like, is that out of key? Yeah. I don't really know. And then I think it's also a great um, thing to have a basic understanding. I don't think you need tons and tons, but certainly enough to be able to say, ah, that's not working because, or right. that's sounding stagnant because, or I want to create some tension now. How do I do that? For example, those sort of things that I think, you know, as soon as you get into the world of anything that's getting to any degree of complexity with, um, you know the the melodic and the harmonic content then I, like i'm totally on board with you but i love your ethos of the way that you're thinking about trying to push yourself and do things that are interesting and outside of the box and if you yeah. want to be able to do that and make it work i can totally see where you're coming from as well i mean you know i want to be i want to be a pro i want to be the like i've been saying this to myself recently i want to be like the pro of the pros that's what I want to be in my head. Like, like the amount I work is, is a lot, you know, like I'm on, like I wake up and I go right to the studio and I'm there until like, I have to sleep. Like I, I work on it as much as I possibly can, you know, <laughs> it's totally crazy. And it's probably something most people wouldn't want to do. You know, most people wouldn't want to put in that many hours and I get it. I totally get it. And I think, you know, that's what separates some of us from other people is like, you know, we're willing to, to, to sort of suffer you know, I don't even want to say suffer, but I mean, sometimes you got to do it when you don't want to do it. I mean, you need that, 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 I mean, at the end of the day, like it's the love for it. Like I actually love it. That makes me want to do it, but, but it can totally be, be, you know, it could be intense sometimes. Like sometimes I, I wrote a song and at the end of the song, I want to throw it away and I want to start over, you know, and I spent five hours on that song and I'll do it. I'll start over. I'll make a new song. Like I'm super brutal, you know? Um, <laughs> uh, but anyways, I want to be the pro of pros and I'm not going to do that by being an amateur musician. You know, I think I got to know, uh, music pretty good and not only music, but like, man, there's plenty of great musicians who can't produce a record for their life. And you know what this is? They don't have any technical skills. You know, they don't know sound design. They don't, uh, listen to music enough. They don't have, uh, they don't have engineering skills, you know? So it, it's not just theory and I don't want to be like, oh, theory, 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 but you know, no, no, you gotta know so much, you gotta know so many different things to, to really, uh, to really be good at this stuff. You know, it's, it's, it's crazy. It is interesting. Yeah. I, I talk about this quite a lot because you, in so many other facets of the art world or just in music in general, um, you know, the, we wear so many different hats. So if mm -hmm. you were to look at maybe how a, I don't know, maybe a rock record was is created. Or, or like Coldplay, for example, listening to Chris Martin talking about that and how he will like wake up at crazy o'clock in the night and then he'll pick up the guitar or the piano and he'll play around and he'll play around and then he gets an idea. And when he's got the idea, that then goes to the band. And then the band hear the idea and everyone in the band now helps to create the drum drummer creates all the drums, like the guitarist plays his part and so on. And then they arrange the thing together. Then that goes to the studio and there's a producer and there's a mixing and mastering engineer. And there's all these people involved in a Coldplay record mm -hmm. in an Addison record. There's you. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> I think that's that's a blessing and a curse. I mean, a blessing because you don't have the the problems of collaborating. Like when you have five people in the room, I, I can't even. I'm, I don't even know what that's like. I've never been in a band. I mean, I've I've worked on music with with a person, a singular person, and that's been good and bad in many ways. But being with a, in a band, like five people, and we all got to agree on something. 
and we have a manager and we have a this and we have a that and like everyone needs to be happy. Like that sounds crazy. That sounds crazy. I don't know how these bands did it. But then right. like, I mean, on the flip uh, side, you like uh, you said double edged sword because you're like, yeah. Well, oh, it's a double edged sword because <laughs> yeah, because then for me it's like I got to do a lot of different parts. You know, I got I got to do everything from you know, I mean, doing the baseline, doing the lead, doing the sound design, doing the mixing, doing the arranging, doing I mean, whatever the list goes on and on. But you know, it, it all it's all related. It's all connected. I think um, so. Uh, yeah, I, I think I think a really great word that aspiring producers should look uh, look look for is to be well rounded. And I think that's the best. You know, you don't have to be so so good at any particular area but you have to be good enough in each field and and you know and and like like i don't think you have to be like be the a scholar music theory guy but but know it a bit know it so you can write chords you know know your sound design enough so you can actually design your own patches because i think sound design is so important man if you don't know sound design it's going to be challenging you know um you know, no, no, no enough uh, about mixing to make it sound good i mean whatever you know i'm just saying you got to be you got to be well rounded uh -huh. Yeah, totally. So let's yeah. actually talk, obviously, with there are all these things that you're, I mean, it's it's really interesting to you say you want to be the, the pro of the pros and the amount of hours you put in incredible. So what does the production process look like for you? So before you've even sat down to write a track, what are you thinking? Um, I guess before I write a track, I want to come up with, uh, I, I want to have an idea of what I'm going to make. Because if I just sit there and just start clicking away, it's like, I don't know, it usually ends up pretty weird. So I think before I make a track, because I listen to music, I listen to labels I like, I, I really, <clears throat> sorry, I, I really want to get inspired. Um, uh, I mean, you know, sometimes I pull up tracks and, you know, and I want to make a track this, like that has this feel, this energy to it. So, you know, I'll, I'll sort of go in that direction. Um, you know, uh, yeah, I think there's usually a certain, a certain energy I'm going for when I'm producing. You know, it doesn't have to sound exactly like this, these tracks or exactly like that, but I want it to have a, yeah, a similar feel, a similar, a similar layout, if that makes sense. Yeah, totally. So there's a, there's a, an inspiration piece typically before you get started. And that, so is that always listening to other music or <clears throat> there are other ways that you get inspired? I usually load up like 10 songs on my Ableton project. And I use maybe one for like layouts, maybe like one for like, you know, I want to use like the groove from this one. And, you know, I, 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 I grab bits and pieces from songs I like and sort of mesh them together. Um, and that's great when you don't have ideas either or inspiration, you know, like I, I pull my inspiration from, from other tracks. I mean, sometimes it comes out of me naturally, you know, uh, sometimes I sit there with a blank canvas at all, but I mean, and just, you know, try and get a really cool groove and then figure out the melodic bits. But, but a lot of the times, I mean, I, I throw like a ton of reference tracks on my project and create like a mood board, um, you know, like a designer would. Uh, and then that's, yeah. And I, I'm not afraid to be influenced by people. I mean, I don't think we need to be living like under a rock where like, you know, everything comes entirely from ourselves. Like, I think, uh, I think it's great to be influenced by people. I think it's great if you can like make something in that style or that genre or there's a groove you like from this track and then you know you remake that groove pretty damn good you know and then you take it somewhere else you know i mean uh, yeah i think i think that's really important for me and it's also been really challenging to to dive into different styles and different uh you know uh different genres and especially for melodies man like when i listen to melodies i like and i study them and i you know the first thing i do is i identify the key of the scale you know i'll be like okay this is in a minor and then I'll see the melody, and I'll just see the the, the way the melody plays with with uh, with the scale. It's, you know, what what's the starting note? What's the ending note? And you know, I, I do a lot of this. I do a lot of analyzing. Uh, I do a lot of study. Uh huh. So yeah. I mean, I, I absolutely love this kind of concept of the the mood board. Now, yeah. One of the things we've spoken about before, and I I don't know whether these things juxtapose or not, but on the one hand, there's the wrote a bunch of, of music and basically you were prolific even though you weren't writing the music that you wanted and then you start building your knowledge and you've got that prolific base in which you can start applying your knowledge which is cool and you've yeah. gone down the road of where well, there are specific things that i feel i really really need to learn 
um, in order to reach the level that I want to reach. Now, right. simultaneously on another road, um, I know that you've talked about also saying I tried, I was trying to do every single little bit myself, but now actually there are certain things where I'll say, well, no, it's okay if a loop fits in here that's okay oh so oh yeah on the one hand there's sort of it feels like there's the the growth of your skill set which mm -hmm. you're massively invested in and on the other side there's the methods that i can use to improve my workflow i guess uh, without having to be too precious about doing every little tiny piece of it if something works it works is that can you speak to that yeah absolutely that's that's been a big one on my mind um i think as producers we want efficiency we don't want to spend too long on any one part. You don't want to spend an hour on a kick drum before you start a song. Horrible idea. You'll never write a song, you know? So what we, what we want to do is figure out ways that are most efficient. And, and sometimes using a loop is totally cool. Like, you know, I was working on a track last night and I had programmed the first bits of it, you know, the first like core elements, but it was missing this like sort of weight this sort of drive and, you know and I start flipping through some of these just basic house loops and one of them or a few of them like just fit it in there perfect I mean it added so much energy to the track and I was like thinking about it um yeah I could sit there and I could have made loops like those loops I could have sat there and I could have programmed you know these two different hats that shuffled and this little effect and compressed and saturated them together and then stored them in my library but that would be a different session you know like, why not use some of these tools I have right here to get things moving? I mean, I get how they're made, and that's cool to know how they're made. But, but yeah, I think, I think using loops is, is essential sometimes. I mean, and these are such basic loops, too, I'm using. I mean, this isn't the identity of my song. It's not the identity of my sound. But they're tools to help me get there, right? And, and also, like, you know, make, using presets. I mean, those can be fine, you know? I mean, those are also tools to help you get to where, where you want to be. You know, and, and I think, and sorry if I'm rambling, but, but I think no, it's no, really, it's Go for it. I think it's really good to separate your, your writing sessions and your sort of, uh, creative, uh, prepping sessions. Right. So, you know, I wouldn't be making patches and sound design in the same session that I'm making a tune. I think those are separate things. I think you should have days or sessions where you're just making weird sounds and making patches and samples maybe drum loops and then you're storing them right so that tomorrow or later that day when you do go into a creative session you got all these tools ready to go you know you already made your kick drum in the other session you designed 10 awesome kick drums and you stored them you know and then later when you come back to the studio they're, they're ready they're ready to go you know so so i think that's actually that's a big topic for me recently is just separating the the, the writing sessions from like the uh i don't know how to call it to call them maybe prepping sessions yeah, I mean, ultimately, that's the way that I would look at it is separating learning sessions, preparation sessions, and creative sessions, because the, the thing in the creative or writing session, as I would call it, is that what we're really looking for, if we can achieve it, and we can't guarantee it every time, but is that magic of going into creative flow. It's that thing where you get lost in the music and stuff is coming together and you're like, oh, and now it needs this thing and that's over there. And now I can grab this and ah, this isn't quite right. And this will come into like you saying about having some sound design knowledge. That's mm -hmm. not quite right. I know how to tighten that up or I know how to make that longer or I can hear that the attack needs rolling off. There's, I, I can hear the change yeah. I need to make and I know how to make that change. Right. Because the minute that you are in creative flow and you try to do something that is a challenge far above your skill set, you come out of it because that's when we're in overwhelm. And that overwhelm could be, okay, I need this particular type of sound. The challenge is too great because I've got nowhere, no idea where it is in this gigantic, crazy library of mine. Therefore, the challenge is greater than my skill set. I end up searching, 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 boom, creative flow's gone. Or maybe for you if you decide oh i i want to write a melody in this particular mode if you didn't have the knowledge to do it and you start now randomly clicking and randomly and randomly that will be fine as long as you're engaged in it but the moment mm -hmm. that it just goes on too long and it becomes boredom now yeah then again we're out of creative flow so actually you know for me i i completely agree with you in making sure that 
a load of the prep is done in advance because we want to be it's not just about efficiency it's about <clears throat> maintaining the that creative magic once it kicks in and sometimes it doesn't kick in straight away sometimes you might be there for 30 minutes or an hour um, right and and you're you're okay and you're having fun but then something sparks you and you can you go down the, the rabbit hole and then you're gone and you're lost in it and if that time gets interrupted because you're going through several hundred presets it can be hard to get back into the magic that you you just managed to get yourself into if that makes sense yeah, hundred percent. And you know, I want to say this. I think half the battle is knowing what you want to make. I think once you know what you want to make, you know, you know exactly what you want to make. You can you can then start figuring it out. You know, you can figure out the type of drum samples you need, the type of patches, the type of melodies. I mean, but I think that's so key. Is is yeah, just knowing what you want. Because I think a lot of my producing career i mean my my songs vary pretty pretty hard but there's been moments where like i just like so much stuff you know i like i like so many different types of music uh and it can be tr challenging to sit down and like actually make something and deciding where where am i going what's my project going to be you know that was always my biggest problem it, even before getting into house i liked so many different genres then now i'm in the house and and I like progressive, I like minimal, I like deep, I like the melodic stuff, I like all of it. And I want to make like all of those tracks. Uh, but, but so sometimes it can get a little hard, you know, sometimes I can be working on a certain style. And then a few weeks later, I'm working on a totally different style. And I mean, I guess it could be good. But um, all I'm trying to say is it's it's good to to be specific and really like focus on a certain thing. And you know, you can really master it. Yeah, totally. Yeah, totally. I, I'm, I'm with you on that as well, for sure. Knowing what you want, and then the next step is how to get there. <laughs> yeah, totally, totally, yeah. So uh, I could probably come in with saying something like, yeah, so totally agree on the idea of sticking in your lane and knowing what you're going after, because if you've got so many influences, and that is great, but particularly when you're starting out, if you're trying to jump from sound to sound to sound to sound, it's hard to pick up the nuances of the music that you're writing. And whilst, you know, I've taught pretty much every music going um, largely, and there are some underlying principles in all of music that always remain the same. Mm -hmm. But you want to get your knowledge locked down in one. And I don't, and the way that I like to think of this is we're not talking necessarily a laser beam. Right. We're talking maybe a torch. So it's a, a number of these little clusters of sub genres that we've got now that we never used to have. So you might be in that kind of area where a lot of the techniques and the things that are going on are similar and play around in there. And by all means, you might find yourself drifting off and evolving as you go through your creative journey. But right. trying to write all sorts of different things because you love everything from i love drum and bass and i love techno and i love garage and i love trance. yeah yeah and those like really quite far and wide and disparate genres totally that's totally. a really really hard thing to pick up on all the multitude of techniques and actually get good at one of them to the point that you're gonna start right. seeing results that motivate you to carry on yeah so so yeah, I mean it's it's cool to like a lot of different stuff, but it could be uh, it could be an issue. I mean it could it could hurt you in the end if you're always jumping around, right? Um, you're not gonna you're not gonna do any one particular thing enough to really to really understand it well. I mean it's taken me so long to be decent at making house music. I mean I you know I had to really make a lot a lot of tracks. Um, also, something that's cool is you know if you can combine like two different things together. Like that, I think is really special. You know, if you can take like, if you can master like two different genres and try to combine them together, I think that's when you get really interesting stuff. You know, I think all these guys who are considered geniuses or revolutionary, I mean, I think a lot of them are just sort of combining different things together. And, and now they've created a new, uh, you know, a new genre or a new, a new trend. So, so I, you know, I like the idea of, of, you know, honing in on something. But I also like the idea of sort of combining like two different things that are, you know, not usually combined. Yeah, totally. So uh, you're technically still honing in on one thing. You're honing in on the combination of these things together. 
as opposed to a multitude of different things. But I guess that's where your mood board thing comes in, is it? Yes, yes. I mean, sometimes my mood board is like a bunch of songs in the same genre, you know? But like, for example, if you were to take a house track and like, I don't know, write all, you know, then take like Psytrance and like combine these things in ways, you know? or you know, you know, have this like reggae influence and like, uh, you know, a hip hop song, or I'm, I'm just saying, you know, just combining these things is I think the next step. And that's what I'm trying to do now. Like, I mean, I, I'm trying to, I'm trying to figure out ways to do this. Cause I think that's, that's cause a lot of the music sounds the same, you know? And I think if we want to get something new, we need to, we need to, you know, you know, combine some, some things together. Right. Yeah. Totally. And, and, so yeah. Have, a, have a wide range of influences, but you know what you're, direction is they're all pulling together as opposed to you trying to write all of the different influences if that makes sense yes uh so yeah so that's key that's key okay so what i want to kind of round out with then is just the the following on of your production process so we've got the the mood board we've got the you know potentially taking different ideas and then evolving them into something else what then happens when you get to the arrangement how do you arrange a track what's your process um i could follow the arrangement of a song i like for the most part you know just the way they they, they build they groove or even follow the arrangement of one of my own songs you know um I mean, we're all using pretty much 16 bar sequences, 16 bar, 16 bar, 16 bar, 16 bar, you know, introduce something new, 16 bar, 16 bar. But it's in house music, it's very much 16 bar. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, uh, you obviously, the arrangement depends on the parts that you have. So I think once you develop like, you know, enough parts and like a good idea, then you can figure out how to arrange it. But I mean, it's really, it shouldn't be anything that difficult. You know, I think once you have the good sections, it's a matter of, you know, just bringing them in and they should really gel together nice. And also you want to start strong. You don't want to start with like a kick drum, you know, like you need to start with like something that instantly has a mood and, and lures you in and then and then you sort of grow on that and, and and also in the arrangement process you can realize the song has weaknesses okay it's boring here or there's too much here right or this part doesn't work i'm going to change this or something else so so i think i think you know we come up with like an idea and then you know when we start to construct it that's when we see if the idea really works um but we should get to the arranging part i think pretty soon you know once we have something that we f feels good we should get out of loop mode because loop mode is dangerous you know you just be in the endless you know loop you know forever so we gotta we gotta make sure we're, we're laying things out and we're actually making music and not just you know being robots yeah totally and i, I think what you've just said there is really important as well that a loop can work really well but it doesn't mean it will transpire into a full piece of music or you think you think it works well you think it works well until you lay it out yeah. and then you hear you hear the bass line come in and you're like wow that didn't actually make give me chills you know i just i was just stuck in loop mode and fantasizing right yeah. so <laughs> and and also it's just getting out of our comfort man like i notice sometimes when i'm producing like i I'm a, like, i don't want to do certain things like, i don't want to start working on the melody i don't want to start working on the bass line i want to just work on like my little groove because the groove's easy you know what i mean this part's easy you know so I think we will, you know, maybe I don't want to arrange, right? Because uh, I know it's going to be challenging. I know maybe I'm not that good at it, you know? So I think it's important that we, you know, we always do those things that, that are kind of, you know, difficult for us and, and get those out of the way. Yeah, I think another thing as well that I, that I discover quite a lot is that people worry that if they arrange it and the loop turns out to be no good, that what they've got is no good. And it yeah. is bliss because if you listen to the loop and that works and you're nodding your head and going, yeah, I'm a genius. It's yeah. easier to leave the studio saying, yeah, that was awesome. And I'm a genius rather than discovering mm. whether it works mm. or not. And, uh, and there's a sort of thing of, Oh, I'm worried I might ruin it when I arrange it. Now that could be true. It could be that we don't necessarily have the skill to arrange it and therefore that good idea kind of falls apart. Or it could be that the idea wasn't really as strong as we thought it was in the first place. But the reality is the only way to find out is to make lots of loops and arrange them. Loop, arrange, loop, arrange, loop, arrange. And then 
the actual mindset of worrying about it reduces because if you've got the loop and you think it's rocking and you start arranging it and actually you go, well, I know my arrangement skills are pretty solid and <clears throat> the core idea just wasn't working here. Mm -hmm. That becomes okay because I can write another loop, mm -hmm. another one and another mm -hmm. one. Whereas if we don't follow that process through, then it's almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy that will be stuck in the loop forever. You've got to go in, be uncomfortable and write stuff that doesn't quite work, but keep going at it and going at it. And as you mentioned before, you get better at every single piece of the production process and you right. just keep going around the cycle. Your skill levels up all the way along the way and you stop holding on so dearly and so preciously to an idea um, because you know that if at any point it turns out that it didn't work out and it felt like it was fire, but really it's not, that's cool because I can make another one tomorrow. Yeah, and, and you know, that for, you know, just two things I want to say about that is, you know, being a producer is basically an arranger. That's basically what you're doing. You're an arranger. You're arranging sound sequences into a song, you know? So yeah, you should be, you know, and it's funny because some guys, they don't know that much, but they're good at throwing loops together. They're good at like, you know, doodling stuff, but they, but they're good at arranging. They're good at like telling a story. Right. So, so that's huge. And, and also you got to finish songs. You got to finish songs. I mean, that's the only way to get better. You got to stay. I mean, last night I was up to like five in the morning working on these songs because I wasn't happy with them. But guess what? I was happy before I went to bed. Those extra five hours I put in, like, I finished them, you know? And that made me stronger as a producer. Yeah, totally. Each bit of the production process that you finish also teaches you something about the thing that went before, which is mm -hmm. a very interesting thing. Like we're talking about how you, you learn when you're arranging more songs more about what needs to be in the loop before it goes into the arrangement so you, right. start, you start to say well it, this is going to need this and this so i'll stick those in or actually i don't need to titivate or mess about anymore this one's ready to get to get going and likewise when you get to the mix down you learn things like okay well had i have picked better sounds in the first place or had i have separated these sounds in the track or had i have separated them by pattern time had i separated them by frequency octave right i wouldn't be in this muddy old mess that i'm in now so we carry that back to things like when we're selecting right. a sound next time we're able to say okay cool well let's try and get something that's got a sweet spot that sits in this octave because actually i've got a bunch of stuff that's going on in there already and if there if i want all of those things to be heard and they're all sitting on top of each other i'm gonna have a yeah. right old mission on my hand when it comes to the mix down of course, of course. And, you know, I would love to do an episode with you just talking about workflow ideas, you know, like approaches, you know, how we're going to build a song, what, what part we're going to do first, and, you know, how to organize your, your libraries, and your VSTs. I mean, I, I think we could do like a whole episode on just that, you know, because that's totally. so, that's, I think about the more I get into producing, the more I just think about workflow and technique, right? Because that's, that's, that's so big, you know? Um, it's, and it's what you said. There's so many efficiencies that people miss. Right. You could, exactly. call, you could even call them hacks potentially, but there are, there are so many long ways round and there are so many short ways of getting exactly the same result. And as I was talking about the creative flow or just the fact that we can move on and finish yeah. more and learn more and grow more every yeah. time you go around the cycle so yeah i'm, I'm sure we could because that like workflow is one of the things that, like, <laughs> it's main huge things. man it's so big and it's so overlooked too right like man i've been changing my workflow so much recently and it's you know it's been inspiring yeah, yeah. it's been it's been making music easier it's basically the the three things of the finish more music system the stuff that i teach one is right one is the mindset one is workflow and one is knowledge which encompasses all of the compositional information Perfect. that we've talked about yeah. as well yeah i, I think <laughs> that as like the holy trinity and and a lot of the time a lot of courses and things that people take could be awesome in one of those things and that's great you get to level up in it but actually all three pieces of the puzzle are what really motors you on and right. you're really really good at this game you know 
that's cool. I think we have a similar ethos because I think we, 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 we agree on a lot of these, uh, a lot of these things, you know? Yeah, totally. We still, really we'll cool. Have to, we'll have to properly thrash out the music theory bit, but <laughs> the rest of it, we're on the same page. <laughs> What's that meme of like this guy, he's like, he's like, what's the mother do? He's like, he's got a keyboard. He's like, all right, what scale are we in? He's like, no, 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 none of that. We're making techno. <laughs> 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 totally so we'll get to the bottom of that at one point well listen mate it's been absolutely fantastic i don't want to let you go though without one kind of final pearl of wisdom if you can for um for producers just anything that you've learned maybe something that you wish you'd have known earlier um that you can pass on to uh to the people listening um i guess uh stay humble and uh look for mentors, look for help, you know, don't, don't try to do everything on your own. Like really reach, like seek, seek for the knowledge. Yeah. I guess, I guess, yeah, I guess that's something I would tell my younger self. That's a great piece of advice. It's some, one of the things I talk about quite a lot on the show as well. I have multiple mentors across multiple different mm-hmm. disciplines. And mm-hmm. I too wish if I could, if, if I was going to jump back in time and tell myself something other than the lottery numbers and all of that good stuff um, <laughs> you know, the piece of information would have been go go and seek help earlier go and you know go and invest in being around the people that are going to be able to lift you up because so many you know and read more books is another great piece of advice Mm -hmm. people have been and done things and have greater perspectives and greater knowledge and they've written it all down in books read right yeah we got music books too yeah read yeah read the books and go and seek out the people who've you know got experience and have got greater perspectives or greater knowledge because they're two different things entirely as well but you know, people that you feel that you can learn from, go and find those people and get around mm-hmm. them and a peer group as well, which is another big thing I think is is absolutely vital. A community, right? Uh, right, makes, makes a huge difference. So yeah, we're definitely at one hundred and ten percent on the same page to close this. Cool, cool, cool. <laughs> awesome, man. Brilliant stuff. Listen, Matt, thank you very much, mate. What have you got coming up that uh, that we can be checking out musically? Normally I'm uh, saying DJ gigs, but that ain't happening at the moment. So <laughs> what do we got in the way of tracks and things that are in the oven? Uh, well, I just finished a remix with uh, my friend Gab Rome, and that's going to be on Blondish's label, Abracadabra, coming up soon. Um, I, uh, you know, I also got a new Akbal release that's in the plans. Uh, I don't have any release dates yet, but you know, uh, I got a few cool projects that are on the horizon, and hopefully those will be out in the next few months. And uh and yeah so we'll, we'll i'll be keeping everyone posted on that yeah totally well we'll link um all of your uh music and stuff into the show notes as well cool. so everybody will be able to jump over to the website and find uh, all of your tracks and where they can pick stuff up listen to your soundcloud and all of those good things as well awesome thank you keith brilliant mate you're an absolute star thank you for coming on the uh, the show and sharing your experience and uh, and the knowledge that you picked up along the way Awesome. It was really fun to talk with you, man. Great. Take care, Matt.